Joining me now is Jennifer Rubin, an opinion writer for The Washington Post and an MSNBC political analyst. She's the author of Resistance, How Women Saved Democracy from Donald Trump, and thank goodness they did. And this week, she published an op-ed in The Washington Post titled, The Senate's Victory on Same-Sex Marriage Should Terrify the GOP. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me this morning. I really want to take your take because I think that there is going to be such a strong push and pull with the Republican Party after voters broke their MAGA fever. And you point out that the huge conundrum that the GOP now faces, it's this. Republicans face a number of quandaries these days that force them to choose between loyalty to the MAGA cult and general election viability. But no question looms larger than how they intend to win office while maintaining the support of Christian nationalists whose views are anti-ethical to a supermajority of Americans. And this goes beyond same-sex marriage. This is what happens when a national political party becomes almost entirely dependent on a group whose views are far out of the mainstream of America. Jennifer, how does the GOP get out of this hole that it's created for itself that is absolutely based on the culture wars that you so succinctly describe in your piece? I don't think they get out of it. I think they're going to lose some elections because there is a core base, um, which is crucial to them, which is the Christian nationalist right, um, who um, has really made their careers, made their livelihood, uh, made their political mark on these sorts of issues. And there's nothing that's going to prevent them from primarying some of these characters um, in uh, two years or four years or six years. And likewise, on abortion, we've seen that they are driven by their core base to propose not only bans uh, in individual states, but a national ban. And in fact, there are going to be presidential candidates running on that. There is nothing more likely to once more stir up uh, the American populace than a, uh, a position that would ban coast to coast um, abortion access uh, for all women. We saw what that happened, what that did to them in the midterm elections. Democrats for once leaned into the cultural issues, which are really freedom issues. They're choice issues. They're government, anti-government tyranny issues. And the Republicans paid a price and they seem completely oblivious or simply trapped by them. And uh, I think the way they get out of this is they'll either have someone who will successfully stay Stand up to the far right, um, which uh, I don't see anyone of that level of courage right now, mm. or they will suffer some more defeats and then they'll have to abandon it. It should be remarked upon that even within the Christian evangelical community, these issues are becoming losing issues. On same-sex marriage, there's a big difference between older evangelical Christians and younger evangelical Christians. So even within their own uh, communities, I think this is a issue of diminishing returns for them. No, and this is one of the things that I found really fascinating about this bill is that it also protects interracial marriage. Again, we're in 2022, where almost a third of Americans are in a type of interracial couples. I am married to an interracial individual, so together our children are absolutely interracial. So what does that say? Should we be praising the 12 Republicans who voted to advance this legislation? Or maybe we should be most focused on the people who voted against it. I think it's the latter. Um, I think voting for this is the bare minimum for being a decent human being in America in 2022, as you point out. Um, but the vast majority of Republicans in the Senate voted against cloture. Um, there were only 12 that went along. Uh, so if my math's right, that's 38 Republicans who did not want to uh, protect same-sex marriage or interracial marriage. And by the way, I think the reason that they included interracial marriage is specifically because when Justice Thomas listed all of the things that he was going to come after, um, including same-sex marriage, including other substantive due process rights, he somehow neglected to mention interracial marriage. And that was a peculiar omission. Um, obviously, he is in an interracial marriage. You can make a legal argument that that's really a equal protection clause issue. But I think that's just indicative of the fact that the Supreme Court is now simply legislating their own um, views on these burning social issues. They don't have a strong constitutional basis. So I think it's entirely appropriate for Congress to step in and say, no, we have come to appreciate, come to believe that there are certain rights that are national, that are not dependent upon where you live in the United States. 
Uh, Jennifer, when, all, when Clarence came out at talking about the interracial bit, my husband and I were joking that there's different ways to basically file for divorce with your spouse in more private settings than on the bench. So Jennifer Rubin, thank you so much for joining me today.